everybody, I hope you're having a great day. So today we're gonna to talk a little bit about the octet rule. You may be familiar with it. Um, so, so far we've learned a lot about how to describe electrons as they exist in atoms. Uh, we've learned about energy levels, the orbitals within them, uh, the fact that their electrons are specified by a certain set of quantum numbers, and that the electrons occupy these orbitals according to the Pauli exclusion principle, the Aufbau principle, Hund's rule, and we get this ground state electron configuration that describes which particular orbitals are being populated by electrons for each element in the periodic table, and blah, 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 blah. So that's pretty complicated stuff, and the octet rule is basically a way to kind of think of electrons a little bit more simply in the context of chemical bonding, and it really helps people understand it and digest it. It's a little bit confusing, especially when you start learning about exceptions to the rule, but we'll get into that a little bit more later. So again, uh, with regard to Lewis uh, theory, and I, and I uh, released a, a video, my last video um, on this channel was about uh, Lewis theory, talking about you know what it is, what it, what it isn't, what it's intended to do, what it's not intended to do. So I suggest you check that out. Um, you don't have to, I don't think you need to know any of that stuff. Um, but I suggest you check it out if you haven't already. Um, but it basically just uses dots to represent the valence electrons, which of course are the outermost principal energy level electrons for each atom. So instead of representing the electrons as you know these fuzzy, cloudy regions where the electrons probably exist, uh, we simplify the whole deal and represent the valence electrons using dots, okay? So the octet rule, going back to that, the octet rule basically says that an atom is satisfied in the sense that the energy of the valence electrons and indeed all the electrons around the atom, the energies of those electrons is relatively low when there are eight valence electrons around the atom. So that's pretty much it. Atoms are happy when they have eight valence electrons around them. It's pretty simple, right? Well, let's just pause for a moment and, and, and just take a moment to remember that the octet rule is just that. It is a rule. It is not a law. It is not a theory. It's a rule. Some rules can be bent. Other rules can be broken. The octet rule is very, very commonly broken. And we're going to talk about the exceptions, as I mentioned before, but they are, it's, it's a very commonly broken rule, but nevertheless, it can be very helpful to digest chemical bonding uh, with regard to Lewis theory. So let's turn our attention to the very first two elements in the periodic table. In the first period, we have hydrogen and helium. Now with hydrogen and helium, there is no way at all that either of these atoms could have an octet. Why? Because in that first period, there only exists the first principal energy level in which there's only the 1s sublevel in which there's only the single 1s orbital, which can only hold two electrons. So there's no way they can have an octet. The best that they can do is to achieve what's called a duet, which as you're probably familiar with, duet's like when two people sing, duet is with two electrons. So when that 1s sublevel is completely full, the electrons are stable and you have a duet. So helium has a duet on its own. Its electron configuration is just 1s2. So it's stable, it's got a duet, which is why helium doesn't really like to bond to anything. It's fine just being itself. And then hydrogen, whose electron configuration is 1s1, must either gain an electron or lose an electron or uh, bond with other atoms to achieve a stable duet. And we'll talk a little bit more about that later too. So hydrogen and helium, the octet rule does not apply. Instead, the duet rule applies. So for all the other atoms in the periodic table, and when we talk about Lewis theory, we're mostly looking at um, the main group elements. So we're kind of leaving out that chunk in the middle that has the transition metals and that chunk at the bottom that has the inner transition metals. Um, when, you, when you study general chemistry and organic chemistry, you're mostly gonna be working with uh, hydrogen and the P block elements. Uh, so like oxygen, um, nitrogen, carbon is a big one, the halogens and things like that, various combinations of those. Just with those few elements, you can make a ton of possible combinations of covalently bonded uh, molecules. But so let's talk about some of these ways that uh, these atoms can achieve an octet. Well, if you look at like sodium, for instance, um, sodium has one valence electron. If sodium loses that valence electron to become a sodium ion, Na+, well, all of a sudden, sodium has an octet in that previous uh, shell, in that previous um, principal energy level um, underneath the, um, the, the, the energy level 
whose electron was lost, right? And so that's one way to get an octet is by losing electrons and metals do that quite frequently. Other ways to uh, get an octet are gaining electrons in the case of nonmetals. So if you take a look at oxygen, for instance, oxygen has six valence electrons. It really wants an octet, it really wants eight. And so it's gonna gain two electrons commonly. Um, there's other ways to get an octet for oxygen, but oxygen will commonly gain two electrons to become the oxide ion, the O2 minus anion and it's got an octet. It's got those two extra valence electrons. It does have a minus two charge, but the octet kind of gives it some more stability because um, I don't think I mentioned it so far in this video, but the reason why the octet rule and the duet rule, why those rules apply is because noble gases are very stable. Um, when the outermost principal energy level is completely full of electrons, all of the electrons enjoy a special stability associated with having a completely full principal energy level. And so that's why the octet rule applies. That's why a noble gas electron configuration is so important. And that's why you can, like, again, I think I said this in a previous video, but you can think of all the other elements in the periodic table as like jealous of the noble gases. They really want to be like them. Uh, they really want to achieve that noble gas electron configuration. So losing electrons, gaining electrons, those are a couple of ways in which um, metals and nonmetals respect respectively can achieve an octet. Um, but nonmetals also have another way, and it's called sharing electrons or forming covalent bonds with other nonmetals. So there are a couple of different ways in which covalent bonding uh, can occur between nonmetals. So um, if two electrons are being shared between two atoms, what we call, we refer to that as a single covalent bond. So a single covalent bond is made up of two electrons or one pair of electrons. Oftentimes you're going to see electrons uh, reported in terms of pairs because they often pair together. Uh, you don't really have free electrons really on their own. They usually exist in pairs, right? So if it's one sh pair of electrons shared between two atoms, we call that a single covalent bond. If it's two pairs or four electrons shared between two atoms, which is possible and it happens all the time, we call that a double covalent bond. And then in some cases, quite commonly, um, two atoms can actually share three pairs of electrons or six electrons and as you may have already figured out that's called a triple covalent bond. So if we look at some of the um, diatomic elements, you may have heard in a previous um, playlist or video or you may have seen it in your chemistry book a few chapters ago that there are some elements like hydrogen, oxygen, nitrogen, and the halogens that exist not as individual atoms but as molecules that each have uh, two atoms of the element covalently bonded together. And let's take a look at why that happens. It's all, it's all about the octet rule and the duet rule. So in the case of hydrogen, for instance, hydrogen, whose electron configuration is 1s1, it wants to have a duet. And so what it can do is it can um, join up with another hydrogen and they each share the two electrons equally. But for the purposes of the octet or the duet rule, you can think of both of those electrons between those two atoms as belonging to both of the atoms. So in other words, by forming that single covalent bond, each of those hydrogens, you can, they're like scratching each other's back, right? They each have a duet. It's a mu mutually beneficial arrangement from an energy point of view. If you look at the halogens, it's very similar. Each halogen has, uh, if you look at like fluorine, for instance, fluorine has seven valence electrons. So it's just one short of an octet. And so if it takes its seventh electron and it pairs up with another atom of fluorine, then both atoms, if you count all of the dots around there, there's, if you cover up one, <laughs> one element and then you look at the number of dots around each of them, then you'll, you'll, you'll see that there are eight valence electrons. So each of those fluorine atoms has an octet. And so we get a bunch of these F2 molecules floating around. Uh, and the same is true for the rest of the halogens. If you look at oxygen, for instance, oxygen is pretty interesting. It's got six valence electrons and so it's two electrons short of an octet. And so oxygen, um, a moment ago we said it can gain two electrons, but it can also share two pairs and, and commonly does share two pairs of electrons with another atom. So if you have two oxygen atoms that share two pairs of electrons, you have this, doubly, this double covalent bond between those two oxygen atoms. So all of the oxygen, all of the O2 that's in our air, roughly 20 or 18 or so percent of our air, all of that oxygen exists as these diatomic O2 molecules, each joined together by a double covalent bond. Uh, nitrogen, which actually comes in at around 70% of our air, is joined together by a triple covalent bond. So nitrogen has five valence electrons, 
three short of an octet, and so it shares three pairs of electrons with another nitrogen atom to get N2, diatomic nitrogen, triple covalent bond. So those are some of the ways in which nonmetals and metals can, can, uh, can, can get an octet. Um, now, if we take a, a let, let's look at a Lewis dot structure for a particular molecule. You may be familiar with it. It's called ethanol, <laughs> and um, ethanol. Um, this is the Lewis structure for ethanol, and so you can see which atoms are connected to which. And uh, not only can you see not only can you see which atoms are connected to which, but you also see all of the valence electrons. They're all represented by dots. They're all accounted for here. And if you uh, take a closer look at this, you'll notice that we have two main types of electron pairs. Uh, we have the pairs of electrons that are shared between atoms. We call those bonding pairs or shared pairs of electrons. And then we also have another type of uh, electron pair that belongs to an individual atom that is not participating in chemical bonding with another nearby atom. And these are called lone pairs or unshared pairs of electrons. So we have bonding pairs, they're used for bonding, and then we have lone pairs which exist only on an individual atom and they're not participating in bonding. Very, very important to understand the difference between bonding pairs and lone pairs of electrons because we're going to revisit those differences in a later video. But uh, another thing uh, with regard to Lewis dot structures and the octet rule is, I mean, you can take a moment to yourself to look at all of the atoms in this Lewis dot structure and confirm that each non-hydrogen atom has an octet, eight electrons, and that each hydrogen atom has a duet, two electrons. So go ahead and do that. All right, so hopefully you've convinced yourself that this is a stable chemical species and we have octets all around and duets in the case of hydrogen. Another thing that's really important to understand with regard to these Lewis dot structures is that the total number of valence electrons in the Lewis dot structure should match the total number of valence electrons for all the individual atoms in the structure. So in this, the chemical formula for this species is C2H6O. So if we have two carbons, each of those has four valence electrons for a total of eight valence electrons coming from carbon. And then in the case of the hydrogens, each hydrogen has one valence electron and there are six hydrogens for a total of six valence electrons. And then in the case of oxygen, we've got uh, one oxygen atom, it has six valence electrons and so that tacks on another six valence electrons. So if you add eight plus six plus six valence electrons, you get 20 valence electrons total and again, you can count the dots in this structure to reassure yourself that there are indeed 20 valence electrons in this Lewis dot structure. Now, this Lewis structure looks like kind of a mess, uh, and, but there is kind of a nifty way to clean it up. I'm sure you've seen structures that look like this. Um, basically, what you do is for every pair of electrons that's shared between atoms, in other words, uh, for every bonding pair, instead of using two dots to represent that, you would use a single line that connects the atoms. So again, each line represents a single covalent bond and it is, um, it's a substitute for a pair of electrons. So if you have two lines together, that would be a double covalent bond. If you have three lines, that would be a triple covalent bond. So I think I'm going to end the video there. Uh, in the next video, we'll be talking about some step-by-step uh, -step instructions on how to draw Lewis dot structures when you're given a chemical formula. Um, and we'll talk about all the implications that come with that. So I hope you enjoyed the video and or found it helpful. Uh, if you'd like to donate to my channel, my PayPal link and my Bitcoin address are shown here. The Bitcoin is a QR code, but I've also got the address in the description below. Really appreciate it if you could help me out. I feel like I'm on a roll here and donations just keep me going in ways that positive feedback never could. I love positive feedback, don't get me wrong. I'm truly thankful for every nugget of compliment that I get. Um, but nevertheless, if you're feeling charitable, uh, you do have the opportunity to donate to me. So thank you very much for watching and have a wonderful night.